production of The Power of One is made possible by CODA, the Central Ohio Transit Authority. Hello, I'm Jerry Ravish, and thank you all for joining the Central Ohio Transit Authority, the Ohio State University, and the Honorable Joyce Beatty at this year's historic Rosa Parks panel discussion this evening. Tonight, I have the privilege of introducing you to a time in history. Charles Neblett, original freedom singer, almost a half century after he stood nearby in Washington, D.C., as Martin Luther King Jr. delivered the world's famous I Have a Dream speech. Russellville, Kentucky's Charles Neblett was a special guest of the President and Mrs. Obama at the White House in February 2010. Rutha Harris, an original freedom singer at the age of eight, Ms. Harris began her journey as a singer in her father's church. After her tour with the Freedom Singers, Ms. Harris continued her work as an organizing singer with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Betty Mae Fikes, Freedom Singer, at the gentle age of four, Ms. Fikes began singing gospel alongside her mother. Famed as a musical genius and storyteller, she continues to perform as a way to keep the stories of the Civil Rights Movement alive. And Danielle McGuire, a noted author and Rosa Parks historian. As history books have told, Rosa Parks, a soft-spoken seamstress, was simply too tired to give up her seat on a Montgomery public transit bus. Rosa Parks historian Danielle McGuire has uncovered that Mrs. Parks was much more than a seamstress. Danielle is also the author of At the Dark End of the Street. Welcome all. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Now, in 1962, when the Freedom Singers were formed, it was for two very specific reasons. First, to raise money for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, which we will hear about in our discussions. And secondly, to help unite African Americans in the cause of integration. This evening, please join me in welcoming a performance by Charles Neblett and Rutha Harris, two of the three living original Freedom Singers, plus Betty Mae Fikes, who later joined the Freedom Singers on tour. Ladies and gentlemen, the Freedom Singers. It's really amazing the part that buses played <laughs> in the civil rights movement. One of the things we're gonna do, we're gonna sing a song that during the Freedom Rides and all of the kids were in Parchman Penitentiary, that other buses was coming. They were coming and it was a song that they sang. Buses are coming, oh yes. Buses are coming, oh yes. Buses are coming, buses are coming, buses are coming. Oh, yes, they're rolling into Jackson. Oh, yes, they're rolling into Jackson. Oh, yes, they're rolling into Jackson. They're rolling into Jackson. Rolling into Jackson. Oh, yes, you'd better get you ready. Oh, yes, you'd better get you ready. Oh, yes, better get you ready. Better get you ready. Better get you ready. Now, if you miss me from the back of the bus and you can't find me nowhere, just come, come on, on up to the front, front of the bus and I'll be riding up there. Well, now I'll, I'll be riding up there. I'll be riding up there. Come on up to the front of the bus and I'll be riding up there. Well, now if you 
miss me from the back of the bus And you can't find me nowhere Just come on up to the front of the bus And I'll be driving up there Well now, I'll be driving up there I'll be driving up there Come on up to the front of the bus And I'll be driving up there Well now, if you miss me from the cotton fields And you can't find me nowhere Just come on over to the courthouse And I'll be voting over there Well now And I'll be voting over there. Well, now, if you miss me from the swimming pool and you can't find me nowhere, just come on over to the YMCA and I'll be swimming over there. Well, now, I'll be swimming over there. I'll be swimming over there. Come on over to the YMCA and I'll be swimming over there. A lot of the music that we did in the Civil Rights Movement had been around for a long time. And it's interesting, we started, when I started looking and, and doing some research on some of this music, and it's one song that we did that black Civil War veterans sang. And knowing, it was interesting in knowing that these soldiers knew that a lot of places in the South, a lot of states in the South, they didn't take black prisoners. If you were wounded, they buried you alive. And if you, and they just captured you and you were well, they would kill you. They didn't take black prisoners. But the amazing thing that these guys volunteered and went to war anyway. We fought for our freedom. And the song that they sang was, Oh Freedom, Oh Freedom Over Me. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Oh, freedom. freedom. Oh, 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 freedom. freedom. Oh, 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 freedom. Oh, oh, freedom. Oh, 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 freedom. Oh, 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 freedom. And before I be a slave, don't you know I'll be buried, buried in my grave and go home to my Lord. Segregation, no segregation, no segregation, no segregation over me, over me. And before I be a slave, don't you know I'd be a buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. What great voices, what great voices. You can just feel that era, that time through your songs. Beautiful. 
<laughs> Mr. Neblet, let's start with you. When did you first get involved in the civil rights movement and why did you? I think one of the reasons why I really got involved in the civil rights movement was the murder and the mutilation of Emmett Till. Mm -hmm. We were the same age. We were the same age. And by him being tortured and murdered like he was, it was me. So they had a trial. They acquitted this, those people. And after that, they gave an interview with a magazine and told them how they did it. And I knew that I had no justice in this country, that they could do the same thing with me and get away with it, and there's nothing anyone would do about it. The courts wasn't on my side, the judicial system. I was just out there. It was the complete dehumanizing situation, and I was depressed. I was going to do something. I didn't know what, but something had to happen. And what was so interesting was is that when I saw Rosa Parks and Abernathy and Dr. King, those black folk, those black men and those black women standing up in Birmingham, Alabama, it's like I got religion. It just lifted off of me because I knew that it was on and I was gonna be there, you know, I was gonna be there. And that's one of the things that really motivated me to really get directly involved in the civil rights movement. Plus my parents, my mother uh, had relatives who escaped from slavery and went to own logs and went across the Mississippi River and they would tell us all of these stories. And as a child I heard all of these stories and even as a small child, I knew something had to happen. And that's one of my motivations for really getting involved in the civil rights movement. And I did that in, well, I started in 1959 on my college campus at Southern Illinois University. And later on, I joined SNCC and so forth. So that's how I got involved. Hmm. Tell me about your reflections about Dr. King. When did you first meet him and what kind of man was he? Dr. King was more like one, a big brother hmm. to us. He was more like a big brother. Uh, in fact, he would sing with us sometimes. He had the southern accent. He says, how you doing? How you doing? Glad to see you. Can I sing with you? <laughs> now, <laughs> he could preach, but he couldn't sing. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thanks so much for that. Let's, let's move on to, to Ruth Harris now. Early in your life, were you aware of segregated conditions where you were living? I was not. My father was a minister. His name, Reverend I.A. Harris. Mm -hmm. He sheltered us from a lot of those that uh, we couldn't go to the movies because he wouldn't let us go to the movies. We didn't go to the hotels because he said, I built this home for you. We couldn't drink out of the, uh, we couldn't go and drink out of fountains. He said, you don't need to drink out of fountains because I have water here for you. So I was sheltered from all of that, but I knew that something wasn't right, you know? So after completing one year of college at Florida and m University in Tallahassee, Florida, I came home for the summer, and I was walking down the street, and either Cordell Reagan or Charles Sherrod approached me and asked me if I wanted to be free. I said, what do you mean if I want to be free? I am free. I thought I was free. And so that led to what for you? That led to my becoming involved in voter registrations, uh, demonstrations, being jailed. Uh, I was jailed three times. Had a wonderful time in jail. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about that, how so? When you're in jail for your rights, you sing and you pray. And that is the best time of your life. I wish all of you could have experienced <laughs> a life in jail during the 
<laughs> during the civil rights movement. Mm. It was wonderful. And there is a song that uh, Bertha Gober, who's on uh, one of the uh, freedom singers who joined us in, um, was that Los Angeles? Yeah. And she wrote a song called Oh Pritchett, Oh Kelly. And Pritchett was the, the uh, chief of police, and Kelly was the mayor. And this song was taken from a uh, Negro spiritual, Oh Mary, Oh Martha. Mm -hmm. And it goes something like, Oh Pritchett, Oh Kelly, Oh Pritchett, open them sails. Oh Pritchett, Oh Kelly, Oh Pritchett, open them sails. Can't you hear God's children crying for freedom? Hear God's children pray in jail. Can't you hear God's children? You know they are suffering. Hear God's children pray in jail. And every time I was in jail, I had to sing that song to him. Mm. Beautiful memory there. Thank you. Betty Mae Fikes, how'd you become associated with the Freedom Singers? I met Charles Luther, 60, but in the 60s, we used to go all through the counties, mass meetings, and I had heard about the Freedom Singers. Now, mind you, during those times, every county mass meeting was just like church. That's why our movement today is so lacking, uh, spiritual, arousing. No one is singing anymore. But when I met these guys, it was like, uh, I come from a very religious family. Mm -hmm. So we had no hotel, well, for blacks in Selma, well, in other uh, <laughs> cities <laughs> in Alabama. Yeah. So when gospel singers, I come from a long line of gospel singers, Mahalia Jackson, you know, the uh, Claire Ward singers. Yes. So all these great people would come to Selma, and they didn't have hotels, so they would stay in homes of people. And I heard all the stories, and I heard all the good singing. And, but they were older people. So when the movement started, I got lifted by hearing this voice here. I went to Albany, Georgia one night to a mass meeting, and the church was packed. You couldn't even get in. And I heard this girl's voice singing, this little light of mine. Who is that? <laughs> then I met Chuck with this deep bass voice and Cordell, and when I heard that, I think Chuck and Cordell were singing Brown Baby. Mm -hmm. And it just turned me on. I said, I want to be a part of that. So we didn't get together. We always would sing together. But uh, the original group was Bernice, Ruther, Cordell, and Chuck. And after uh, Bernice went into other things with Sweet Honey and the Rock, then I kind of replaced her in the group, but I've been followers mm -hmm. of these people for 50 years. Wow. <laughs> but Betty Mae, uh, when I met her, I was in this church packed in, and I heard this voice, and I didn't know where it was. I heard this voice, and I had to find that voice. When I found the voice, I saw this little girl who weighed about 20 pounds. <laughs> 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 With all of this voice, you could hear out of all of the singing, that voice was coming through. And that, uh, that's when I first really found her or saw her. Yeah, yeah. Betty, let me ask you, what do you think the music did at those mass meetings when you all stood up to sing? What was the effect of that? Oh, well, like Ruth had stated a few moments ago, you would have had to have been there. There's no way you can really today put it in words. But when you have been on a picket line or been protesting all day, and there's a mass meeting that night, and you see people like Worth Long that's coming in that had been on a picket line and that had been beaten brutally 
by Jim Clark. And when he walks through the church, he wore those thick rim glasses, and his face was all swollen. Those are the things that made me become committed. But in that, when I seen things like that, I found out how important music was. Because when they would walk in, you could hear old gospel songs shine for me. And you wonder, because my thing was, like I said, I come from a long line of preachers and deacons and good gospel singers. But it had been taught from a child about God and how good God was. All I wanted to know where was God when all that was going on. So with that, and with the people of the movement, taking on such a struggle in my hometown, I had to keep singing. You had to keep singing. Danielle, what drew you to the topic of the civil rights movement, and mm -hmm. specifically Rosa Parks? Gosh, I'm from an all-white town in Wisconsin, and so everybody thought I was crazy when I wanted to start studying African American history. but. I loved the idea of ordinary people changing the world around them. And I loved the idea of the little guy standing up against the big guy, the David versus Goliath stories. And it was it, the first time for me reading the stories was the first time I felt um, like there was a God and like, you know, ordinary people could make extraordinary change and mm. that we had the capacity within us that there was a light. Um, and Rosa Parks always fascinated me because of her, uh, her quiet strength, but also the more I discovered about her, I realized how fierce she really was and how uh, committed she was to the movement and how much of an activist she was since a very young age. I mean, she grew up in the Garvey movement. And her grandfather's a Garvey Garveyite, and uh, she started doing activism in the early 1930s with her husband who worked on the Scottsboro defense. And they hosted voter league meetings in the 1940s, armed voter league meetings. Um, and she became uh, a member of the NAACP in 1943. So I was just fascinated by this, and I wanted to know more about her. Tell us about the Rosa Parks that people don't know about. Give us some things. Well, I think the story of Rosa Parks has been told in a way that limits her um, commitment to human dignity and justice so that we get a tired seamstress who tiptoed into history instead of this proud woman who marched into the future with courage and conviction. Rosa Parks was a committed activist for human justice and dignity, and she worked every day of her life in multiple organizations, not just the Montgomery NAACP, but um, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the largest all-black union in the nation. She was the secretary for that organization in Alabama. Um, she was the leader of the, she was the NAACP Youth Council leader, so she was counseling young people about how to make change and how to use their light to uh, bring justice into the world. And then after she was, uh, uh, out of Montgomery, she was an activist in Detroit where she moved in 1957 and she fought for open housing and she fought for equal employment opportunity and she fought against police brutality. She helped organize uh, black communities after the 67 uprising and worked for black power. She was a fan of Malcolm X and she gave the eulogy at Robert Williams' funeral. Robert Williams was a radical activist uh, who believed in armed self-reliance from Monroe, North Carolina. She spoke at his funeral. So the Rosa Parks that we get in high school textbooks is really um, um, muted compared to the Rosa Parks who, whose life was committed to justice and who worked for over 70 years to achieve that. 70 years, and, and toward the end of that, did she get tired of the interviews and tired of the uh, attention? I don't know. I mean, my sense is that she probably got tired of the same questions being asked of her mm -hmm. and people focusing on one moment in time, uh, one year, one day, one particular instance of her activism. Considering that she was such a committed activist for so long, um, I, would, I would imagine that it would become annoying to be asked about the uh, Montgomery experience every single time she was interviewed, but I'm not sure. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move now to, uh, 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 we're going to do another round of questions here, and then we're going to um, have you do another performance for us, okay? Yeah. Tell me what it was like on the road 
as a freedom singer? Uh, it was <laughs> it was really interesting. Uh, we had never, we were young, we were like 20, yeah, 20, 21, 22, and, uh, and we got, in, got on the road and we were going everywhere. Um, but the thing was is that we weren't only singers, we were organizers. We, we used music not a, as a motivator and as an organizing tool. So what we were doing, we were organizing with our music because we uh, sang the Carnegie Hall, we did the Folk Festival, uh, we did uh, the Jazz Festival, the Newport, the Folk Festival, we did McCormick Place in Chicago, we traveled all over the place. Yes, In I fact, we traveled know. almost 100,000 miles, 50,000 50, miles one year in a station wagon, <laughs> <laughs> in a small station wagon, and, and we almost killed ourselves, you know, just being on that road, and everywhere we could lend our voices, that's what we did, and in fact, we organized Later on, the kids who came down for 1964 Mississippi Summer Project, we'd been to so many of those schools organized that most of, a lot of those kids who came, we had been in touch with before. Mm. So not only did we organize, uh, we raised funds for the movement, and we organized Friends of SNCC uh, groups all over the country to support the movement in the South. So it was a, it was a, it was a job. It was, it was really a job. Ruth, how'd you all support yourself on the road? You had to eat, had to sleep, had to put gas in that station wagon? We were given $10 every two weeks. A week. <laughs> I thought it was every two weeks. I'm sorry. <laughs> Chuck said a week. Um, and that's what that we would get given that to buy our toiletries. But we stayed in people's homes, and uh, they fed us. That's how we survived. Was it dangerous work? At some point, like driving through, I remember driving through uh, Alabama, and we were shot at while we were driving through Alabama. And we were all afraid because the only person who couldn't duck was the driver. So you talking about some praying folk. <laughs> oh, we were praying that we get through that without any harm to Cordell, and we did. So Betty, you were a long with this group through all of these perils. Did you ever get discouraged or were you, this is something you just knew you had to do? Well, it was something I knew I had to do. Once I've seen so many people that didn't even know me, leaving this home, leaving, dropping out of college, to take on this fight for freedom. So I knew then when I met Bernard Lafayette was the first person I met that came to Selma and he was asking the questions, uh, did we know that our parents did not have a right to vote? And that question had never been asked before because I just thought all adults had the right to vote. You know, we were taught in school that that was our constitutional right. But when I found that out, and through the years, before, you, it makes you go back and, well, if it's like this now, how was it slavery time and from slavery time to the 40s and 50s? Because in Selma, after church, the older men would get together and talk about the crisis that was going on. And we had a Mr. Doyle and a bunch of other elders of our city that kept everything intact. So I did not know that our parents didn't have the right to vote. I didn't know that we didn't know that we were not free. But when people were coming from Washington, North Carolina, all around the world to Selma, Alabama, I knew then that it was something wrong. But I was sheriff, which was, I'm sure you guys heard about our famous Jim Clark. He said that it, that coon had come to this town and turned it upside down. Everything was fine before he got here. Well, how was it fine? 
I couldn't understand as a child if you have uh, two fountains right together, as close as these mics are here. And if you stoop to drink, you're looking right in a white person's face. But our parents were so protective that they kept us from stuff like that. But you know, we were like children of the day. We slipped down to Cresses just to see about this water that they're talking about. <laughs> and when we would go, you know, you always have a lookout person. And you run in and sip the water, you run out. It don't taste no different. <laughs> <laughs> so it was things like that that brought me into the movement. And it's kept me into the movement because mm -hmm. I didn't know that like I said, that my parents didn't have the right to vote. So when that question was laid on us, all they asked us as we were children just to pass out leaflets to tell people about the mass meetings. And I thought it was something to do, and I had something to do other than going to church. So I was glad to join the movement, because it was something people 50 years ago, you know it was something every night about church if you were Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, that brought me into the movement. Yeah. And I'm committed to that today. I look at John Lewis and I tease him all the time. I said, John, the reason you don't talk well because she was beaten so severely. <laughs> <laughs> but it was people like him and others, Chuck, Group, and Martin, that kept me in the movement and have me still standing bravely for it today. Danielle, when you, when you started doing your research, uh, how were you accepted in that? And, and did you have to deal with any sort of skepticism about a white woman doing black history? You know, I really didn't. Um, I think there are always people who, for example, now when I talk about my book and I walk in and they're like, oh, it's the white girl. <laughs> what does she know? But, uh, but that doesn't last very long. And, and in all the interviews and work that I did in the South, I was, I was always very warmly welcomed by black families and black folks who wanted to tell me their stories uh, and were interested in talking to me. Um, so I never had any issues like that. I mean, there were only a few times when I found something in the archive. I was in Montgomery, mm. and I found uh, Rosa Parks' signature on a postcard from 1944. She, she was working on uh, the defense case of an African-American woman who was brutally attacked, uh, raped by a group of white men. And I had never seen mm. this before, and I didn't know she was involved in cases like that. And I jumped up, and I said, oh, my God. And... Uh, the, the archivist came over and said, shh, what'd you find? And I was afraid to tell them because they were white. And I, and I thought they would you know, shut down the archive if I told them the kind of things I found. And so I said, oh, it's nothing, it's nothing, <laughs> sorry. Um, so my own biases sometimes got in the way of my um, work in that sense, but, but I never ever had any issues, no. Yeah. Mm -mm. So how would you make the case for black history being American history? Well, I think uh, last I checked, there were black people in America. Mm. So I think that, the, I mean, you can't have American history without talking about uh, the African-American contribution to American history. You just don't have it. I mean, African-Americans were here from the very beginning. They built much of the infrastructure of our country. They built much of the um, capital infrastructure of our country. Their labor made the country rich. Uh, made certain white people rich, made institutions rich. So uh, there is no American history without black people. Great. We can't leave without one more performance by the Freedom Singers. Ladies and gentlemen, the Freedom Singers. I've been jailed over 20 times. One of the things that would happen when we're talking about the mass meetings. A lot of times, the sheriff and his boys would come into your church with dogs. Come in there with, with their dogs to terrify the people. And one of the important things about music is something that you can organize around. And what would happen is somebody would start singing. 
And when one person started to sing, then everybody would start to sing. And one of the songs that we would sing, the sing at that particular time was, I ain't gonna let nobody turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. I'm gonna keep on walking, keep on a talking, marching up the freedom. Oh, I ain't gonna let your dog turn me round, turn me round. Turn me round, ain't gonna let your dog turn me round. I'm gonna keep on a walking, gonna keep on a talking, marching up the freedom. Oh, ain't gonna let your guns turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let your guns turn me round. I'm gonna keep on a walking, gonna keep on a talking, marching up to freedom. Oh, ain't gonna let no jailhouse turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let no jailhouse turn me round. I'm gonna keep on a walking, gonna keep on a talking, marching up to freedom. Oh, ain't gonna let nobody turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. I'm gonna keep on a walking. Keep on a talking, marching up to freedom. Land. I woke up this morning with my mind. Stayed on freedom. Well, I woke up this morning with my mind. With my mind, it was stayed on freedom. Oh, I woke up this morning with my mind. It was stayed on freedom. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Walking and talking with my mind. Oh, my mind it was stayed on stayed on freedom. I'm walking and talking with, with, with my mind. It was stayed on freedom. You know I'm walking and talking with my mind. Mind it was stayed on freedom. Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. Come on and walk, walk, come on and walk, walk, come on and walk, walk, now with your mind on freedom. Walk, come on and walk, walk, come on and walk, walk, come on and walk, walk, well, I walk, 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 you gotta talk, talk, you gotta talk. Talk, you gotta talk, talk. Now with your mind on freedom. Talk, talk. You gotta talk, talk. You gotta talk, talk. You gotta talk, talk. When I oh 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 talk, 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 talk. Cause it ain't no harm to keep your mind. Your mind keep it stayed, stayed on freedom. It ain't no harm. You keep your mind, you could stay it on freedom. We know it ain't no harm. You keep your mind, you could stay it on freedom. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Pastor Jeffries, welcome to the table tonight. 
Let's start with today, and then I want to backtrack a little bit in my, my questions to you. Has the election and re-election of Barack Obama improved race relations or worsened them? It depends on how you're defining race relations. Um, we are at a point in American history where white Americans as a whole are, are very comfortable uh, welcoming individual African Americans into their lives, into their homes. Uh, we've become used to it uh, over the last few decades, welcoming uh, entertainers and artists, uh, individuals, uh, Michael Jordan, uh, Magic Johnson, Oprah Winfrey. Uh, and so it's not that far of a stretch, not that far of a leap uh, for uh, white Americans as a whole to welcome into their, uh, into their political lives an African American. When we think about the first election, Barack Obama spent uh, some $750 million uh, to be uh, accepted uh, on his own individual merits, uh, which is a sea change uh, from where we were just a few decades earlier. Uh, so certainly that reflects a change, an improvement in, in race relations. Uh, but we still have a long way to go because we have not made the leap, and, and, and it's reflective of this in the political discourse leading up to the most recent election, uh, where even those uh, well-meaning white Americans who have embraced Barack Obama uh, tend not to make the leap uh, from uh, the characteristics that they see, embrace, and endure, and appreciate in Barack Obama to applying those to ordinary African Americans that they don't know. Uh, so we will see a, uh, the next great leap forward uh, when Americans as a whole uh, can look at a, a Trayvon Martin uh, and see in him, not knowing him, but see in him those very same characteristics that they celebrate uh, in a Barack Obama. Uh, so certainly we have made strides, uh, but there's a long way to go uh, when we even just look at uh, how we uh, discuss, talk about, treat, uh, and relate to uh, the current president of the United States. We've been hearing um, echoes of the 60s here this evening and, and hearing about what it was like. And when we look at the civil rights movement today, is there even one to speak of? I mean, th there's always been a struggle for freedom, uh, for African-American freedom. It's wonderful, uh, the songs that the Freedom Singers selected, Oh Freedom and Freedom on My Mind, their very name, uh, the Freedom Singers. Uh, you know, the, the African-American freedom struggle has never just been about civil rights. Uh, it's never just been about human rights. It's about, been about this struggle for freedom broadly defined. And that has, that has manifested itself in many ways. So until African Americans, until all Americans uh, have full access to health care, until we no longer have poverty, until uh, we no longer uh, have barriers uh, to political participation, then there will always be a movement. Now, it may not look like uh, what it once did, uh, but you certainly have people organizing on the ground, organizing for change around these basic civil and human rights that many people are still denied today. So it may not look like it did. It may never look like it did. Uh, but certainly there is a continuation of that struggle because freedom uh, is still on the mind of many people. The, uh, the fastest growing, the largest minority group now is Hispanics. Do you see, how do you see that playing into the dynamic of uh, civil rights activity going forward? Well, we do know that race relations uh, in America has always been viewed through a black-white prism. Uh, and so uh, while uh, Latinos are certainly the largest growing population, they still are wrestling with uh, the ways in which white Americans as a whole, um, individually, personally, but then also structurally, have dealt with racial minorities uh, over the course of the centuries. Uh, so, you know, they, the, the, the struggle for freedom isn't certainly limited uh, to African Americans. They are s Latinos and, and other uh, people of color in America are going to have to wrestle uh, with many of the same issues, many of the same obstacles, many of the same problems uh, that African Americans have historically wrestled, for, wrestled with and have fought for. So one of the great things I think that we ought to always keep in mind when we think about the African American freedom struggle, when we think about the civil rights movement, is that it never was just about uh, gaining rights uh, civil or human just for African Americans. It was about universal rights. It was about extending freedom to all people. 
uh, of all races, <laughs> both black, white, Latino, Asian, other men and women. It was a human rights struggle, a freedom struggle. So I think uh, all people should bear that in mind. Uh, Latinos, uh, African Americans, white Americans, everybody. Understand that this was a, a struggle for universal rights for all people. And once we realize that, uh, we will realize that not only does the struggle continue, uh, but it continues um, for, for all people uh, who are here uh, in America. So as you look at President uh, Obama's um, interests nowadays, it, it seems to be he's very much involved in, in immigration uh, activities, uh, very much involved in, in gay rights, very much involved in uh, moving along Hispanics. When it comes to black folks, we've yet to see him step to the mic and speak on behalf of black people. What do you make of that? Well, there certainly has been a noticeable silence uh, and, and in many instances with regard to uh, policy uh, directed specifically, targeted policy directed specifically towards the African American community. Uh, and I, for one, have been disappointed by that. And I certainly understand the politics of it, um, the, 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 the difficulty of talking about race even in the 21st century. I certainly understand the politics of it. But that being said, I think it is incumbent upon the African American community, in particular in this instance, uh, to keep the pressure on the President of the United States. No President of the United States, whether he's Barack Obama, uh, or Bill Clinton, or anybody else, uh, should get a free pass uh, for uh, not addressing specifically the problems, the circumstances, and conditions that African Americans are, face, are facing as a group. So that being said, it's necessary for African Americans, especially now moving into the second term. And I was a little bit disappointed with our own community because even before the election, uh, there were so many people in the community who said, well, we understand that Barack Obama can't talk about race because uh, you know, he may lose out to the, in the primary uh, uh, competition to Hillary Clinton. Then he won that. Then he said, well, he can't talk about race now because he won't win the, 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 the actual race for the White House and lose out to McCain. So, well, he, didn't, he was kind of silent. They gave him a pass there. Then it was the first term. He said, well, he can't talk about race now because he won't win re-election to the second term. Well, it's the second term now. And it's time uh, for us as a community to put pressure on the president, just as we would do any other president. Uh, he cannot get a pass. And he won't do anything unless the community puts that pressure on him. So if we want him to do something, then it is incumbent upon us to make him do it. And now is the time. There's no other re-election uh, coming up. This is it. This is it. Dr. Hassan Jeffries, thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to open the mic up. Now it's your opportunity to come to the mic and ask your questions of this historic panel before you tonight. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, it's, I'm really excited to be here um, tonight. So thank you so much for this opportunity, and I'm really excited about it. I'm kind of nervous about the question I've been drafting for the, <laughs> for the whole um, time. But I'm really interested in coming to find out um, how do you all define activism? Because I've heard a lot, of, a lot of our panelists say, you know, I'm an activist, or people help call you activists. But maybe how do you define activism? Um, and in what ways do you all, everyone on the panel, kind of see yourself as activists? All right, thank you. We'll start with Mr. Nevlin. I would define it as being able to get out of the box to make change. I define it as being on the front line, not hanging behind. I think what you do to change the world around you, not necessarily globally, but even locally. And active is being active. You can be calmly active, and you can be actively calm. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to be active to be in the movement, to organize. Being active is being active. So whether you're going to be calmly or you're going to do it wrongly. I'd rather see it than calmly active. Mm -hmm. I think of activism as uh, being engaged in your community and being engaged in, in, in whatever is important in your community, whether it's uh, uh, being involved in local schools, whether it's involved in uh, um, issues of poverty in your community, and, and then 
you know, playing a role, getting to know your neighbors, talking to people, uh, going to the meetings, finding out what you can do, and then helping to spread the word, so being an educator as well. And I think that uh, you don't have to wait for someone to lead you yeah. uh, into something. You can be that leader, you can be that person, you can that be that, that power. Thank you all. More questions? Yes, sir. I'm a community leader from the village of Urban Crest and the mayor there. But uh, I have a passion for young men. Our young men, our young women. Now, uh, basically, I'm just directing my, my question because you guys have been on the front line. You've been there where dogs, water holes, all those things take place, and you've actually witnessed that. But for our young brothers and sisters today, they don't realize the importance of the sitting on the bus by Miss Parks. And the, the, you know, you guys standing up for your rights and for the rights of others for where we are today. If you had one thing that you could say to a young man or a young woman today to help change their views of the way they see life now and the importance of what you went through to get them where they are, or should I say we are today, what would that one thing be? I think one of the things that we've failed at as adults, I tend to not to look like the young people have the problem. We the ones who have the problem. Um, one of the things that we haven't done is taught our young people their history. They don't know who they are. And we haven't taught them, not even in our homes or in our schools or whatever, they don't know. And if you don't know who you are, you know, you're just hanging out there for anything. And we've done a bad job in teaching our young people who they really are. And they are somebody and they count. Um, I would tell them that people have died, people have been beaten, people have been jailed, and because of that, you've been given a chance to attend any school you want to, to go to any restaurant you want to, or to attend any church you want to. Because of that, you're standing on the shoulders of those people. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I, you know, the, the, the beautiful thing about um, the African-American freedom struggle uh, is that the people on the front lines were, were ordinary folk, and they were young folk. Uh, the people in the trenches were young people. Uh, college age, high school age, and younger. Uh, if they could do it, if they could face the challenges of their day uh, and come out even stronger and still fighting today, uh, then certainly um, the young people today uh, can do the same. Uh, one thing that, that, uh, that is frustrating uh, when we have these conversations, because I was young not too long ago, long ago, but not too long ago, um, is that we're dismissive of the obstacles, the cares and concerns of young people. And say, well, you, 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 there's no fire hoses, uh, so you ought to be all right. There's no Jim Crow sign, so you ought to do it. Well, there's still serious obstacles in their way, and we have to take those seriously and take their cares and concerns seriously, but at the same time, give them that uh, strength, that encouragement uh, to say, it's been done in the past, mm -hmm. different conditions, circumstances, but it's been done in the past. Your people have done it in the past. There's no reason uh, why you can't do it today. And I always say that within yourself to believe within yourself. I don't care how much freedom that you get that a man gives you. You're not free until you free your own mind and your heart and spirit. We don't have a spirituality that we're passing on to the younger generation today. So the younger generation can't stand on 
things that they really don't know anything about. I traveled the country and I, you would be surprised at the young men and women in college that have never heard of Fannie Lou Hamer. Hmm. I was even surprised to find out today in different schools that there are a lot of black kids have never heard of Martin Luther King. Hmm. And I don't tell them to so much try to prepare yourself to be another Martin Luther King. I always tell children to believe in yourself. You can be anything that you want to be. And they have a cliche that goes out today that says, just ordinary people can become extraordinary. Yeah. I think that uh, it helps to change the stories of history. So part of the reason why I think students sometimes aren't inspired by the civil rights movement or don't know what to do with it is because the narratives that we've given them are kind of boring. King is just a dreamer that just wanted black and white kids to play together. And Rosa Parks is, a, is you, know, uh, you know, an elderly, matronly woman with tired feet who just couldn't get up from her seat. Um, and, and, and so they turn away from those stories because they're kind of blah. Um, and I think boring, that they're say. boring. And, and, but they also don't teach you how to change anything. Danielle McGuire, Betty Mae Fikes, Dr. Hassan Jeffries, Ruth Harris, and Charles Neblin. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this tribute to Rosa Parks 2012. I'm Jerry Ravish. Good night. Production of The Power of One is made possible by CODA, the Central Ohio Transit Authority.